Okay, so um, uh, why don't you start off by telling us um, how is it that you uh, came to know Dr. King? Well, I, uh, I was a journalist in Vietnam, and I did a, an article for Ramparts magazine, which was a progressive magazine at the time. And um, Martin King was a subscriber to that magazine. And when I came back from Vietnam, I did an article called The Children of Vietnam, which described uh, the war crimes that America was committing in that country and uh, the horrific uh, loss of life and the, particularly the effect upon the, on the children. So um, Martin was on his way to, uh, to the Caribbean on a holiday and he was stopped at the, he was at the Atlanta airport where, from where he was flying and uh, he went, was, started going through his mail and there was ramparts for January of 67. And he read the article, he didn't read the article, but he opened it, he opened it and he started to look at the photographs that, which I had taken. I kept all the photographs to myself when I was in the country and I also uh, did not uh, do anything with recordings I made. So he looked at these, at the photographs of the wounded and named and dead uh, uh, civilians, particularly children. And Bernard Lee, his bodyguard, had gone up to get something to eat and came back with some food. And he put it on the table and Martin just pushed it away and said, um, I don't think uh, I'm ever going to enjoy a meal again until we end this wretched war. And uh, that was his introduction to my work anyway. And then when he, he came back from um, his, his trip in the Caribbean, he asked to meet with me and we met. And during the last year of his life, we, uh, we were quite close and we strategized a lot about uh, how to change things in America. And uh, that was the birth of the idea that he had had about a poor people's march in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Washington. So I came close to him during that last year. I, I spoke um, on April 15th uh, to a large rally in front of the UN and suggested uh, to that crowd that there be a third party of Martin Luther King and led by Martin Luther King and Benjamin Spock. And the crowd uh, obviously rose in acceptance and when Martin came up to speak, he, uh, he indicated that if he did such a thing, it would really only be for the purpose of highlighting the horror of the war and ending it. And uh, he delivered a speech at Riverside Church on April 4, 1967, a year to the date before he was assassinated. And there was a powerful anti-war speech that he delivered. So he was very much in the fold then. And uh, uh, I met him for the first time in... Uh, uh, and, and I guess it was like January or February when we, when we met at uh, Brown University where he delivered a speech and I was to meet him there and we were to go together to Harvard where we opened uh, Vietnam summer. And I showed him uh, in that trip all of the files that I had readily available and he wept, he openly wept. Uh, he was a man of great compassion and feeling, and uh, he, uh, he knew that he ha had to do something about this war. Uh, now, you mentioned the speech uh, in, in the Riverside Church uh, on the war in Vietnam in uh, April of 67. What would you say was the significance of that particular speech? So, so the real significance was that it, it, it put him, his, his footprints, heavily into the anti-war movement for the first time. And he, he termed the United States the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. And so he was rising as a severe principal critic of, of the government in that speech. Another negative significance is that he was, he was attacked from all sides. Uh, he was called a traitor by the mainstream media. Um, millions of dollars were withdrawn from his organization, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. So he lost a great deal by taking that position. 
So all of that is significant. So when you heard of the assassination, what was your first impression, and did you believe the story that was presented to the public? Um, my first impression was one of great sadness, um, and not total surprise because Martin Martin knew he was uh, uh, his life was in danger, and they were likely to take him out at some point in time. Uh, when the official story came down, uh, yes, I believed it. Uh, uh, with, the, with the naivete that most Americans had and I had at that point in time, I, uh, I thought that, in fact, it was this uh, lone gunman, James Earl Ray, uh, who, for whatever reason, had been the assassin. Now, who was James Earl Ray? Well, James Earl Ray was a uh, small-time... Uh, character from, uh, from uh, Midwest, from uh, basically from Illinois, and he, uh, he worked at odd jobs when he, when he could find them, and when he couldn't in order to survive, he, he committed petty crimes, petty burglaries. I mean, he never was involved in any serious uh, a, a felony that involved murder. So he was the most unlikely uh, kind of kind of character to have carried out such an assassination, uh, because he was um, he was not equipped to do that in any way. So how how did you come to work on uh, Ray's case? Well, Mark Lane asked me to go to the prison uh, where he was and uh, to interview him. Uh, Mark didn't initiate that. Abernathy and I had talked about the killing, and Abernathy said, let us do that. Let us go up and do it. And let you interview him and interrogate him and, and say what you see what you come up with, and we'll, I, I will go, we will listen. Well, I knew nothing about the case. So I said, Ralph, it's going to take me quite a while to provide, to prepare for this, and it did. And Lane, the... Lane then said, yes, by all means, uh, uh, come up here. He, I will arrange the interview, which he agreed to do. And uh, he arranged the interview. In a, it was in, in a, a interview room at the, at the prison in Tennessee. And uh, at that point in time, um, uh, I had, it was so, several months after we initially were uh, asked to do this, and so I was fairly well briefed, and uh, uh, present also at the interview was Reverend James Lawson, who had invited Martin King into Memphis in the first place, and uh, there was also, um, I brought a body language psychiatrist, a specialist, to watch James, because I put it was going to put him through a, a great deal of stress and uh, so I brought Dr. Behrens in, who was to watch him and see what he became most stressful about in the course of the interview. So following the interview, what was your impression, especially with the body? Uh, my impression and the impression of everyone in the room was that James O'Reilly did not kill, did not shoot Martin Luther King following that five-hour interview. Uh, but we did not know what role he might have played or how much he might have known but we were convinced he was not the shooter. So how, how did Ray escape from the Missouri State Penitentiary in 67? Well, we, <laughs> uh, we, we, he, was, he was always trying to escape when he was in prison, and we thought that that's, uh, that was par for the course, and that he, he lucked out, and he, he was able to get into this bread truck that was delivering bread to the prison and get away. And that's, that's what I thought for all of those years. And it was only within uh, really the last uh, four or five years following a deposition of a, a critical witness that we learned that in fact the government had profiled James Earl Ray and they had effectively organized his escape. And I, I learned that because uh, the head of the Dixie Mafia family who was working with the FBI on the ki killing drove to the prison and in the car was his son 
and they carried $25,000, which they gave to the warden uh, to organize James's escape. And the son was, was my witness for, the, for that, uh, and uh, that, is that mission with his father. Seems pretty telling. Yes. Uh, now, who was Raoul, and uh, did Ray meet him? Oh, yes, Ray met him. And who, who, who was he? Raoul was, a, uh, Ray, Raoul was James's handler. He was the guy the government assigned to handle James. That means to keep, keep tabs on him and have him ready to be in the right spot at the right time. So, he, so Raoul was to do that, and he did that. James met him in a bar up in Montreal when he was trying to get out of North America and, and get to Europe, and then he ultimately wanted to go to Africa where he thought he, he would be most safe. So he met this guy in the, in the bar, and uh, Raoul promised him uh, that he would get him traveling papers, which, of course, James didn't have, if he would uh, do some, some jobs for him and hang out with him for a while, he would get him the papers. Naive James did that, uh, went back over the border, went to Birmingham where he bought a car that Raoul gave him the money to purchase, a white Mustang, and Raoul, Raoul effectively handled James throughout until the killing. Was, was that between 67, 68? It was, it was between uh, mid-67 in August, around August, September, and of course, April of 1968. And we had, uh, I, I, I found a British merchant seaman uh, who identified Raoul as having been in that bar. He met Raoul in that bar uh, before James did, and Raoul offered him uh, some money if he wanted to, uh, if he wanted to buy some, uh, some weapons that he could sell. They were involved in the selling of, uh, of weapons. Uh, as well, and so um, um, Raoul offered him uh, an opportunity to uh, purchase the uh, purchase the weapons if uh, if he if he could. And who was uh, Eric S. Galt, and how did Ray come to use this alias in the lead up to the assassination? Well, as a part of his um, a part of his movement. Around uh, he he went. Of course, he went into Canada. He was given the Galt identity. He was given it by one of uh, a man he would never reveal, but he was clearly a government agent. Um, it's very interesting about James. He was determined never to be a rat on people who ha who helped him. Uh, inside prison or out. And that was one of the characteristics in their profiling that I think they really liked. James, in fact, um, was given the, the uh, uh, identity of Eric S. Galt because Eric S. Galt worked in, a, uh, in, a, in an arms factory in, uh, in Canada and uh, he had security clearance from the United States government. And he, he had a physical resemblance to James, which was interesting. Not, not dead on, but definitely a physical resemblance to James. So it was a very, good, a, a very good identity for James to have. If James ever was picked up for anything they, uh, with, the, with the Galt identification, they would run it and they would immediately uh, let him go and be instructed to let him go. So he, they, they had that well, well thought out. James was uh, given that identity for that purpose. It seems rather overly convenient. Yes. Um, now, uh, you write, uh, if I were asked whether Raoul and Ruby knew each other and whether there was a link between the assassination of MLK and JFK, I could only truthfully answer in the affirmative. So what is the connection between the assassination of JFK and the assassination of Dr. King? Well, I think uh, Raoul definitely knew Jack Ruby. Uh, he was identified, I had him identified by some of Ruby's girls who used to see them together in, uh, in, in Ruby, one of Ruby's bars. So they definitely knew each other. They definitely knew each other. I don't think there's any question about that. Um, I had a witness who tied them together, but who also indicated pretty clearly that Raoul was also involved in the JFK assassination. 
And in James's car, in the pocket of the front, uh, front seat of the car, um, some papers fell out when the two FBI agents found the car. And on one of those papers in James's car was, a, was the telephone number of Jack Ruby's place in, uh, in Dallas. So uh, Ruby and Raul definitely knew each other. The extent to which they, uh, Raul was involved in the JFK killing, I don't know. But it's clear, and Glenda Graber, who was my witness, who, to her misfortune, knew Raul, uh, said that uh, she, uh, she was certain that he was involved in JFK as well. Did James Earl Ray shoot MLK? No. No? James Earl Ray did not shoot Martin King. He was nowhere near the scene of the crime. At the time, he had taken the Mustang and we had driven it up to a garage to get a, spare, a flat spare tire changed because Raul might want to use the car later on. He didn't want him to have a problem if he had a flat and, a, and he had a, the, the spare was flat. They had to change it. So James was up at this, at this gas station waiting, and he never did get a change because he was going to have to wait too long. He was waiting, and when he heard the sirens, and uh, this was after the shooting, he then drove back to the area where he, had, where he had been, and there were police everywhere. And so as he came up to Main Street, uh, they waved him away from the scene, and he just went. He just left. And remember, he was an escaped convict. <laughs> <laughs> and he was very nervous about, about getting picked up. Now, the reason we know this is the case is that the car was parked in front of Jim's grill, and two witnesses came out of the grill, two men came out of the grill, and they, they saw the car, and they spent some time looking at it, and then they started to walk up the street. And when they got a couple of blocks up the street, they got to a street called Vance, and just as they got to cross Vance Street, that same car, that same Mustang, came right around the corner. One of them almost stepped in front of it, the other one pulled him back, but they saw James driving that car. So he was actually driving away at about 25 to, to 15 minutes to six at that time, just before the, the actual killing. And these, these two men gave statements to that effect. And those statements were never aired or never shown, and we found them in the in the bottom of the uh, of a filing cabinet in the in the uh, state attorney general's office. Is that by Didn't chance it? just from digging? And yeah, wow. we we had been ultimately given permission to review the files, and this was uh, in preparation for a a a documentary. Uh, at the time, a live documentary at the time, that was uh, that was shown in 1993 on April 4, uh, and it was the trial of James O'Reilly. It was a documentary that had an actual. We actually tried the case for uh, for 10 days, and this was part of the research. We were involved in doing a great deal of research, and the state was convinced that we wouldn't find anything. They assigned somebody to help us, but we. We were really very thorough in going through every piece of paper that we could. And that documentary, uh, uh, the, the jury, which was a, a random choice jury from all over the country, took seven hours to find James not guilty. So if it wasn't James Earl Ray who shot MLK, who did shoot MLK? MLK was shot by a man called Frank Strouser. He was the best shot on the Memphis Police Department. As a police officer, he fired the weapon from the bushes behind uh, the rooming house. And his spotter was a chap uh, called Earl Clark, who went down over the wall and was seen going down over the wall by a taxi driver who was taking some people away from uh, the uh, some people away from the uh, from the motel, and we know it was Strouser because he was he was assigned to the rifle range, the shooting range of the Memphis Police Department, 
and a man uh, who was a janitor in that police department, um, uh, working at that, a janitor working in, in that building, um, saw a rifle being brought in and he was show, actually even shown the rifle as a special rifle, they called it. And Strauser was given that rifle and he practiced with it all day, the day of the killing. He shot, practiced shooting all day with it. And uh, around about three o'clock, uh, he packed up, took the rifle, uh, got in a, a car, a car of a colleague of his who was a fireman and drove down to the, to the area of the rooming house. And uh, th this man, this witness we had, indicated very clearly that there was no doubt in his mind that he was the shooter and he was, he was going to affect the assassination. Now, did the shot actually kill him? And if not, how did he die? Oh, the shot did not kill him. We all believed that Martin King was killed by that shot by Strausser. He was still alive when he was taken to the hospital. He was work, being worked on in the emergency room of the hospital. And I think the emergency staff were trying to do their best to keep him alive. And he was still breathing and alive. When the neuro, head of neurosurgery of the hospital, Dr. Breen Bland, came in to the emergency room with two other men in suits. And he said to the people in the emergency room, stop working on that nigger and let him die. And then he said after a pause, now get out of here all of you, leave this room, get out. And he emptied the room. And as he was uh, emptying the room, a surgical nurse was the last one out. And she uh, heard them do this, like picking up wa water in their mouths. And that caught her attention and she turned and she saw them spit on the body of Dr. King, the three men. Then she saw Bland, Dr. Bland, take a pillow and put it over his face and suffocate him. And that's how Martin King was killed. Now you can say, oh, you only had one witness. You had this black surgical nurse. She went home the next morning, gathered her family around her in, the, in their home and said to them, I don't know why they had to kill him. And she repeated this story. And it was one of her sons who under oath and under video uh, deposition told us all, all this story about how it happened, how she saw it happened. And we, everyone in the room of that video deposition believed him. He was blind and he was a diabetic uh, uh, victim. He had no reason to lie. He was very moving with the way he, he spoke and he told us the truth. Now, you could think one could say, well, you still only had one witness. You know, good journalists for something as horrific as this need two witnesses to confirm it. Well, we had another witness. Again, the son of the head of the Dixie Mafia leader told us that his father, had, his father died, by the way, and the elder brother took over the assassination uh, responsibility. So the elder brother and he were, in a, were sitting in a meeting with Dr. Bland. Dr. Bland was their family doctor. They were sitting in a meeting with Dr. Bland and Bland said to the son, Russell Jr., if the bullet doesn't kill him, make sure they take him to St. Joseph's Hospital and we'll make sure that he doesn't leave there. Now the son, heard this at the time, the boy heard this, and he was uh, not a uh, you know, young kid, he was, well, he was about 15, 16 at that time, and he heard that. And this, is, this was a two-day, multi-hour deposition that I did of him that brought out a lot of these facts that we otherwise never would have known. 
And he today is, is in a hospice, I believe, dying of, of cancer. But he wanted to get this truth out, uh, off his chest and out of his mind, the involvement of his family in this case. So he's, there's still a living witness alive today? Well, he was dying uh, of cancer, so I don't know how, how far along he is. Uh, but he, he was the, the one who gave us that final confirmation that we needed. Now tell us about the civil suit against uh, uh, Lloyd, is it Jowers, Jowers? Jowers, And, and yeah. what's the significance of that suit? Well, Lloyd Jowers owned Jim's Grill, which was behind which were, was this uh, very heavily overgrown bushes area. And it was from the, that bushes area that Strouser uh, affected the killing of King. And uh, Clark helped spot it. Then Clark went down over the wall. And by the way, I neglected to say he was seen going down over the wall by the, the taxi driver who was killed that night by one of the Dixie Mafia guy, handling guys. They killed him. Because he saw Clark going down over the wall, running up the street, and getting into a police car. That took him away. Okay, so Jim's Grill was behind, this, this bushing, grab bushes area was right behind Jim's Grill. Okay, and um, Jowers ran Jim's Grill. He was there in the kitchen and he ran the grill. Jowers was paid a large sum of money, which he put in an unused stove. And one of the sisters of his mistress told us about the money that was in there. But his, his mistress um, went to, was going to see him that day. And um, around about a little few minutes before six, she went into the grill and she, she, she started to go toward the back, uh, into the back area, into the oven area where they, where they, where they, were, where they cooked the food. And as she entered that area, she saw something very strange. She saw the back door of the kitchen that led out to the bushes open. That was never open, it was always closed. And she got concerned that Maybe Lloyd was out in the back fooling around with one of the local girls. So as she, she went toward that door, then she heard a shot, single shot, she heard it. She got to the door and she looked out and here comes Lloyd running toward the kitchen with a still smoking rifle. White as a ghost, pale, he brushed by her, came in, started to break down the gun in front of her and said, Betty, you wouldn't do anything to ever to hurt me, would you? And she said, no, Lloyd, of course not. I wouldn't do anything ever to hurt you. Well, she thought he had shot Dr. King and that he was guilty of that. And she kept that secret from 1968 until I was able to finally get it from her in uh, around 93 or so, 94. And she then said what, uh, what, what she saw. And I assured her that it was our view that Jowers was not the killer, but that he was a, a knowing participant, but not the killer. Well, because we knew that we had <clears throat> Betty's story, Betty Space was her name, we had her story. <clears throat> We then got the story of a local taxi driver named McGraw, who said Jowers told him, showed him the gun and said, this is the weapon that killed King and all of that. And uh, so McGraw, and McGraw was a, was a vital witness to us because minutes before the actual killing, he went into the rooming house and went upstairs because he had a call from Charlie Stevens, who was a drunk inhabitant of the rooming house, to take him somewhere. And as he went up the stairs, the door to the bathroom was open and the light was off. And he didn't think anything of that, but he went around to Stevens, who was dead drunk. He didn't take him. And uh, he then just went back and 
bathroom was still empty. Remember, it was the bathroom from which James was supposed to have fired the shot. Bathroom was empty. He went down the stairs, got into his taxi, started to drive away, and then heard on the radio that Martin Luther King was just then shot a few minutes ago. So he realized he had been in the, in the rooming house, the area where the shot had, had supposedly come from. McGraw testified for us that uh, that bathroom was empty at the time, and also that Jowers had showed him the gun. So Jowers was clearly incriminated in, in this case. <clears throat> so when we had nowhere to go with James, oh, I went as far as to the Supreme Court as far as I could with him. <clears throat> Excuse me. And James died in 1998. Then I talked to the family and we decided to bring a civil case against Jowers and that would give us an opportunity to bring all of the evidence that we had at that time out. So we tried that case in 99 for 30 days with 70 witnesses who told the story that we, uh, that we knew at that time. And I didn't know, uh, I remember at that time I, I didn't know uh, Tyler, Tyler Adkins, the boy, he hadn't come forward yet. He came forward about a year or so afterwards. We didn't have him. Uh, no, actually, he came forward about 10 years afterwards. We didn't have his evidence that I, I've told you about. But we did have a substantial amount of evidence. And the jury, it was a, it was a Memphis jury, a Memphis judge, civil court, a 30-day a, a trial. And the jury took 59 minutes to find that James O'Reilly did not kill Martin King and that Jowers was guilty of knowingly participating, but that Jowers had a small percentage of involvement and that the major uh, and, and people involved in that case were officers, agents of the United States government, the state of Tennessee, and the city of Memphis. So this was, the, this was the result of a trial in 99 when we didn't have all the evidence that I, I since uh, acquired and put in the book, The Plot to Kill King. Now, what can you tell us about the media's role when it comes to uh, covering up the details of your investigation? Because it seems that uh, the media at the time did have a pretty big role in that. So. Can you maybe, yeah, describe what the media's role was when it comes to covering up your investigation? The media has covered up all aspects of the truth about this case and this horrific killing of this great prophet. The mainstream media has been totally controlled uh, by the owning corporate uh, rulers, <clears throat> and it has never revealed this. When we had the trial, uh, the media was present when Coretta King took the stand or any member of the King family took the stand. Andy Young took the stand, testified. They, they, had the, they were present for that. But then they abs were absent for the evidence. <laughs> they walked out for when it came time for the evidence under instructions. Court TV was uh, supposed to cover the, the trial. And they said, this is the trial of the century. We definitely need to cover this trial. And they didn't at the last minute. Mm -hmm. They refused. So what all what we know is that corporate media has not covered uh, uh, any aspect of, the, of this trial or this investigation that would bring out the truth. And if it weren't for people like uh, Jim Corbett, uh, who is responsible for this uh, interview, um, it would, the, the, the truth would never be known. I, you know, I fear that the truth will be buried because the corporate media has stuck to the original story of James O'Reilly being the killer. Are, are they just uh, ignorant or are they complicit? No, they, they, are, they certainly are complicit, um, but they are, they are controlled by the ruling forces of this republic. And it's not only the killing of King or Kennedy or Malcolm or Robert Kennedy, and I've I also been involved in the Robert Kennedy assassination. Uh, it's not only those critical assassinations in the 60s 
Um, but it's anything to do that will shake the core of credibility in the institutions and the agencies of the American government, how they actually function. You have to remember, Carl uh, Salzberger gave Alan Dulles 12 slots <clears throat> on the New York Times back in 1959. Those 12 slots, in my view, have probably been rotated right to the present day. They are agents who will deal with the most sensitive matters. I have been blacklisted by the New York Times forever, forever. They won't use my name. They didn't use my name and, and virtually anything. I think they slipped once in the 99, one report on the 99 trial that they had to do. Uh, they quoted a witness and the witness said, what Mr. Pepper showed us, and they, they, were, they were quoting him, they put that in. But other than that, it, I, I may be recognized as the attorney for the King family, but never named. And I am, I am not to be named in that newspaper. Uh, and it's, a, it's a, as simple as that. I've had to live with this, as have many other uh, progressive journalists in, in, in areas of, of very, very delicate strategic uh, issue. They don't, they don't want this out, and they, they won't allow it out. That's the basis of corporate control over the media. You mentioned you have a mainstream media interview coming up next week. What do you think they're That's intention? very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. The Washington Post is sending a reporter in next week uh, to do a story. I won't go into great detail of what I surmise about that because I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to discuss it, but I, I I can say in general terms, there's been a change in ownership in the Washington Post. I believe uh, the change in ownership has resulted in the agency having uh, a behind the doors back uh, inf backward influence. Um, over certain stories that the Post will do. I believe there is also a great under-the-cover animosity toward the FBI. And uh, there is no greater FBI crime in the history of the Bureau than this one. Hoover paid and instructed and worked with the, uh, uh, the group for the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., Given all your research into the, the details uh, that you've uncovered about this assassination, um, <clears throat> what do you think was the primary motivation behind the killing? I think assassinations, political assassinations, are a last resort, as a rule. That may not be the case with respect to the, the current government of the Russian Federation. But I think in terms of the United States, from what I've observed and throughout its history, and there have been assassinations other than those in the 60s, remember, I think it's a, they're a last resort. I think if they can, if a, if a person is troublesome to them and potentially can develop a following, I think they, they have to stop him. Now they can do that by rendering him unemployable, by having him set up in some kind of uh, a scandal or a sexual activity that des destroys his credit or her credibility. They can buy him off by giving him a job or position. There are a variety of techniques by blacking him out in terms of the media, the way, for example, they did for Pete Seeger, my, friend, my dear friend, for seven years. They blocked Pete. He had the... Pete went around singing in schools, his message, you know. Um, and so if they can't control any other way, <clears throat> and the person is that critical in terms of potentially mobilizing people, that's when political assassinations take place. Assassination is the last resort. Martin King was assassinated not only because he was bringing enormous thought to the whole Vietnam War effort, and, and opposing it, and the, 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 the corporate militarists of the society, the weapons providers, energy providers, and all of that, uh, 
were going to lose huge portions of money if that war ended. So it was not only that, but, he, but it was the fact that he was going to bring half a million people to Washington and the Poor People's March. And the military believed that they would see their mission as a failure because they would go to the Congress, try to get them to change the, the priorities for public funding from, from the military, take some money from the military and bring it into the social services programs and they wouldn't be successful. And that would, that would radicalize the group to such a point where they might have a revolution on the streets of Washington with masses they couldn't control. They didn't have the troops. Westmoreland wanted 200,000 more in Vietnam. They didn't have those. So they certainly didn't have the troops to put down that kind of revolution on the streets. They were, they were unhinged by what was happening in France. Remember, in France there was a revolution that was in the making with the unions, communists, and the students trying to take over the government and, and, and dethrone de Gaulle. And the only reason that failed was because there was a chap called Andre Malraux, whom you may know of in terms of his writing, brilliant intellectual, and he advised de Gaulle what to do. He advised de Gaulle not to use violence, not to use force because they were, they were going to be overrun by the numbers. Don't do that, but co-opt the military, co-opt the, uh, the union, co-opt the communists and the union leaders, and leave the students out to dry because they couldn't manage it on their own. And that's exactly what happened. Well, there was no Malraux in America. They, we didn't have that. Johnson didn't have that kind of advice and that kind of ability. He knew one thing only, brute force. And that was not going to work with the numbers. So they had to kill King to make sure he didn't bring that kind of dynamic into Washington. And they were successful. You know, I was, uh, I was told uh, uh, by a briefer, uh, the daughter of a briefer of, of Lyndon Johnson during the war, named John Downey, <clears throat> who came back, <coughs> who, who was the actual the, the head of the only uh, military intelligence group in, in the Pentagon in Washington. Downey would go, was a, before all that, Downey was a briefer on Vietnam and he used to go back and forth and he used to brief Johnson. And he always put forward a question in his briefing. Why are we doing this, Mr. President? This is a, a loss of blood and treasure for what? Why are we doing it? And he would ask that question every time and the president never gave him an answer. Finally, one day, Johnson got tired of hearing that question and he pounded the table and he said, John, I can't get out of Vietnam. My friends are making too much money. Now think about it. That's what it's all about. Understand. John Downey went home that afternoon. <clears throat> I told his wife, pack your bags. I'm having myself assigned to the embassy in Canada. I'm not doing this anymore. I can't be an accomplice to the loss of these young American lives. So this was a man with, with this extraordinary complicated and complex issues arise with a man such as John Downey, because you can see he has this compassion and this concern. But he was called back in 67 to organize the assassination of Martin King. The military aspects of it all came under Downey. The photographers, the eight-man team, uh, SWAT team in Memphis, none of them were, the, 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 those shooters were backup. They were not used. But, and the photographers were, and they did shoot the whole assassination scenario. But Downey controlled all of that. So how you, you, you say, well, how could this man uh, be a part of such an assassination and at the same time show such humanity in terms of what? that? For me, it is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a conflict. That one, it's a gray area that has to be acknowledged and has to be dealt with. And the only thing, the only thing I could come up with was that Downey regarded King as an enemy of the state 
He also probably was a racist coming from an area of Pennsylvania where racism was the call of the hour. So that he saw nothing wrong with getting rid of this enemy of the state, whereas he saw everything wrong with this war in Vietnam. So these are the types of gray-ish you know, conclusions you come to. So you can't just blatantly condemn all these people as being evil. And uh, I, I certainly don't. Downey's daughters didn't want to talk to me, but she uh, uh, eventually did, and I interviewed her for three hours mm. and got this story. You know, you raised the story about the, uh, the, about the media, too, and uh, how it, how it uh, exists. Um, there was an, um, an American editor of high credibility and integrity called uh, William Atwood, Bill Atwood, he was editor of Look Magazine. I don't know if you ever know about that. Well, when my Vietnam piece came out, <clears throat> Bill Atwood asked me asked to meet with me. And I said, well, you know, here we go again. Uh, I have Mike Wallace asked to meet with me as well, and I almost put him through a wall because he accused me of being a traitor. And his whole idea of meeting with me for a 60-minute story was to get me to somehow bend me to somehow be acceptable as an interviewee, which I wasn't, and, and, uh, and uh, so he called me. He called me a traitor as well. But anyway, I said, "Well, here we go again. Here's this guy, editor, publisher of Look Magazine." So I, I said, I'll, "Okay, I'll, I'll go to see him." I walk into the office. He comes to greet me. Puts out his hand, shakes my hand. He said, "I said, he said, Bill, I think you'll." You'll be interested to know I had a visitor last week. I said, well, who would that be then? He said, uh, uh, Averill Harriman came in to see me. Well, I knew Averill Harriman, of course. He was governor of New York. He ran for the presidency. He was ambassador uh, to Russia. Uh, and so and a very powerful Democrat, really up on the upper echelon. So what did Governor Harriman want? He said, well, he came uh, at the request of the president of the United States. President Johnson asked him to come and see me and give, him, give me his, Johnson's, best regards and wishes, and then ask me for a favor. I said, ah. Oh. And what was that? He said, well, the favor was that I would never publish anything that Bill Pepper wrote. He says, how do you think about that? You're not even 30 years old. And here the President of the United States is afraid of you writing something that I might publish. What do you think? I said, well, I'm more interested, Mr. Atwood, in what you said back to Governor Harriman. <laughs> what was your response to that request? He said, well, I told him we're going to interview you. We're going to see you next week. And if we believed what you were saying, we were going to publish. So that's where it is. Give the president my best regards. I said, there's, there's an example of what a journalist should be, right? Okay. The next week, unfortunately for all of our stories, he had Jim Garrison up from New Orleans on the JFK assassination. And he, he, I might have spent five hours with Bill. I imagine Garrison, Jim must have spent seven or eight with him, really shook him. So he called Bobby Kennedy that night at 1 a.m. Remember, he was close to the Kennedy family. He was an ambassador, I believe, to Kenya under, for Jack Kennedy. And so he was, he was close to that family. So he called Bobby and he said, Bobby, I'm just shaken to my boots because the district attorney in New Orleans has said that uh, the CIA killed your brother on behalf of the ruling forces of this country. And Bobby said, we know that. But I've got to get the White House to reopen the investigation. Now, that conversation must have ended around 1.20 or 1.30. At 4 a.m. in the morning, 4 a.m. that same morning, Bill Atwood had a heart attack. He left Look Magazine, never to return as editor and publisher. Did roving stories and things like that stuff. He was basically gone. And uh, the deputy editor who brought us in, uh, Chandler Brossard, was fired by the new editor, and neither the stories, of course, Garrison's or mine, was published. 
There are, there are some very specific examples of uh, things. But Atwood was in a class by himself. I called his wife after he died. And she said to me very kindly, she said, and very graciously, Bill had a lot of respect for you and your work. But do me a favor, Bill. Please don't involve me uh, in any way in anything, any work that you do. I have to raise some children in this country. And I've, <laughs> I've respected that wish ever since. Hmm. There sounds like a lot of covering up going on here. Um, so uh, we're wrapping things up. C can you tell us a little bit about uh, Gerald Paul, uh, Posner and, and his role in, in covering up the truth about what happened with the assassination? I mean, it sort of goes without saying. Posner <clears throat> did a, um, a cover-up book in terms of the JFK assassination, uh, and he <clears throat> tried to do one in terms of the King case. He never interviewed me. He never interviewed witnesses who uh, had uh, contrary information to what he wanted to hear or put in his book. He just simply didn't. And he produced uh, an, an, another volume of lies about the King case. The, the story of the King case is finally revealed in The Plot to Kill King, my last book, my third book. Remember, I've done three books over a, <clears throat> it's a period of about 40 years that I've looked at this case. And the first book was in uh, 1995, Orders to Kill. The second book was in uh, 2003, that followed the civil trial and focused on the civil trial. And this book, uh, 2016 really, when it was finished, <clears throat> The Plot to Kill King, is the final book that summarizes everything and puts in all the new evidence. So it, <clears throat> it's there for history, historians, and researchers. Is it there for the masses of the people? It should be, but it probably isn't. There may be, however, some events that will be developing over the course of the next year or two uh, that will shake this country and that will open up some of these stories that have not been called to, to, to fact before including the 9-11 the massacre in this country. So having said that, do, do you have any <clears throat> final thoughts on, on, on what you think the American people, <clears throat> people of the world in general, need, need to know about, about what took place with this assassination um, in general? I mean, what would you say people need to come away with uh, an understanding if, if they were to read your book? I, I think they should understand very clearly that the government of the United States, agencies of the United States, killed Martin Luther King, Jr. And that it was not a lone nut, uh, James Earl Ray, but that it was a well-developed assassination plot that, was, uh, in this case, in the case of King, was orchestrated by J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI and their contacts with the Dixie Mafia and I don't know how many other times Hoover has used the Dixie, Russell Atkins and the Dixie Mafia group to kill people who were perhaps getting in the way in terms of local politics and state politics in the South. I suspect quite a lot and that they had profiles and they, they had James Earl Ray's uh, escape from prison and were used for other crimes as well. But if we know factually that's what happened in this instance. So they should understand that the government of the United States threw, in this case, the Federal Bureau of Investigation killed Martin Luther King. With respect to Robert Kennedy, we can surmise or, or speculate as to who, which agency was actually behind the killing of, of Bob Kennedy. It's very clear to me that it, was, it wasn't Sirhan Sirhan. I'm his lawyer, as you know, up to the present time. I've taken the case through the Supreme Court, and we're now with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, trying to just get, for the first time, a genuine evidentiary hearing, which he's never had. Remember, when, he was, when Sirhan was tried, his defense lawyer was under a pending federal indictment and had to do exactly what they told him to do, which he did was to 
clearly, blatantly throw the case, starting off in his address to the jury, we are not going to uh, tell you that our man was innocent. Our man, our, this defendant was guilty of killing Robert Kennedy. We're only going to ask you to understand why he did it, type of thing. So they were admitting, the defense counsel was admitting guilt right at the beginning of the, tr of the trial. The evidence on the Sirhan case of his, uh, of his innocence, in my view, is stronger than what I saw in for James Earl Ray. Stronger for Sirhan. Now, who killed Robert Kennedy? He was killed, four shots were fired at him from behind at powder burn range. One just behind his right ear that killed him. Sirhan was never closer than five to seven feet in front of him. In front of him. And in, in having been hypnotically controlled and, tra and, and trained, fired two shots from a, a pistol that had eight, and he was, his arm was pinned to the table while the rest of the, while the re shots were heard elsewhere. All right, so there's no, no question about it. Sirhan is innocent. The only question is, can we, can we ever get justice for one of these people? Ray died in prison, we failed there. We can reveal the truth, but he died in prison. Sirhan is in prison, likely to die in prison. We're trying to open that case up as well.